Good morning. I behold the Christ in you. Let's welcome each other into the space by singing the hymn of that name on page 65. Not that much shorter than you are. <laughs> My goodness, Aisha. Good morning, everyone. So nice to see you. I'm Reverend Barb Adams. I'm the minister and spiritual director of Unity Rochester Spiritual Center. And it is so nice to see your bright light. You don't even know it, do you? You don't know it, do you? I see it. It's beautiful. I'd like to welcome all of you to this humble place of spirit and love and joy, a place where we can join together and recognize the truth. We'd like to welcome our first time visitors. If you're here for the first time, would you kindly raise your hand and we'll bring you a packet? Okay, you're all settling in, beautiful. Um, I'm not sure that my administrative assistant, Venus Cottrell, can hear me right now, but this is Venus's birthday, so when you see her, <laughs> would you let her know? Because she does outstanding work for me, and she's a joy to work with. I would like to offer congratulations on the engagement. Cheryl and Sue recently got engaged and they have asked me to officiate their wedding. Cheryl and Sue. Would you like to stand? No? No, it's okay. It's a true honor, it's a true honor. And I've seen the love in your eyes, both of you, especially when you don't know anyone's looking, if I'm sitting back there or if I'm watching the video and I'll see your arm go around the other and your heads kind of come together and I go, aww. <laughs> Our guest speaker today is Mary Jo Tenike. Mary Jo grew up in a lovely Cattaraugus County and moved to this area in 1974. She found more beauty in Wayne County where she and her husband Dick lived for 42 years, recognizing the presence of God in the orchards, farms, and the lake. Yet the people in her life have been the truest source of a growing awareness of God's ever-present love and grace. Mary Jo has three grown children, seven grandchildren, in whom she and Dick find constant delight. Her professional career was in Wayne County, teaching second grade and third grade for 12 years 
as well as nine years in elementary librarian. After achieving a second master's, this one in library science from UB. During the 11 years in which Mary Jo stayed home as a young mother, she developed a career in storytelling, grateful for studying under some generous and amazing teachers. With a background in both Methodism and Catholicism, around the late 1900s, Mary Jo began asking in prayer for further guides. Joining Unity in 2005 was just one answer to that prayer as she feels blessed to have discovered many teachers that ultimately point to the teacher within. Mary Jo is currently serving as secretary to the Board of Trustees here at Unity. She served as president for two of her previous years on the board under Reverend Celentani. She continues to thank all of those in her life, including every one of you, for being a shining testament to our source. So we will welcome Mary Jo. I offer you a blessing as you settle into this sacred space. This is a sanctuary and love of acceptance of all. This is a holy space of inquiry where you are asked to think on your own rather than being told what to think. We ask questions for you to ponder so that you may discover your understanding of truth. If you would like to close your eyes for the blessing. Our holy creator, we offer gratitude for the abundance of love, health, family, and friends, and for the prosperity of offerings provided for our continued growth. We honor the divine within ourselves and each other and know that it is through your divine grace that we are so gifted. Oh, for the wee voices that are so beautiful. And we thank you, God, and affirm that all is well, and so it is. Amen. Amen. Prayer chaplain bringing up the prayer box is Liz Santa Maria, a prayer chaplain, member of our board, longtime member of Unity, and just a loving soul and spirit. Thank you, Liz. Contained within the prayer box are your prayers and your intentions, your offers of gratitude for those intentions that truly have been answered, yet somewhere they are being blocked from our perception. And we ask Holy Spirit to reveal that healing to each of us. Thank you. Prayer of love to all. Thank you, Liz. Holy Spirit, we ask for the blessings of these intentions and offers of gratitude, knowing that they have already been answered, if only we will remove the blocks from the awareness of the presence. And we thank you. Today's daily word is going to be offered by John. <laughs> <Psst>. <laughs> that was a stage whisper. Psst, John. By prayer chaplain John DeFrey. John Frank. <laughs> yes, we are. In honor of the lesson from Mary Jo today, I'm going to speak pronoun of oneness and use we instead of I. Today's word is healing. God's healing power is moving through us. We are open and receptive to God's healing power within us and within our dear ones. We trust with absolute faith that God is greater than any worldly condition. We cannot limit God. We listen to the still small voice within and feel guided along our healing journey. If fear and worry get the better of us and we start to feel anxious, we call forth the healing power of the indwelling Christ. We spiritually surrender our concerns. When we pray for our dear ones, 
we do not focus on their condition. Rather, we see them as the divine beings they are, whole, prosperous, and spiritually perfect. As we pray, we perceive God's healing presence moving through us and our beloveds. This presence is the health beyond the illness, the abundance beyond the insufficiency, and the life beyond death. It is the truth of our life. Your healing shall spring up quickly, Isaiah 58, 8. Thank you, John. May we recite the Lord's Prayer together, please. Our Creator, Please join me in singing Weave, which can be found on page 212 of the hymnal. And we'll do just um, one and three. Our affirmation today, I'll say it once and then you, I hope, will say it with me. In oneness with source and all creation, we are eternally free and at peace. In oneness with source and all creation, we are eternally free and at peace.
Okay. Golly, I have rewritten what I'm going to say today five or six times. And every morning in those last hours before I wake up, like a whole different thing is coming to me. So. You know, <laughs> in 1980, I resigned my position of teaching and just gave myself over totally to what I really wanted to be, a young mother of three young children living in the country and just reveling in that challenge and that beauty. And somewhere in that decade, I became exposed to um, the art form of storytelling and had time to practice it and enjoy it. And I remember being at a workshop at Syracuse University, and there was a storyteller, Stephen Stiller, there, who said, um, you know those butterflies you feel before you start telling? And definitely, I feel those <laughs> right now. Um, he said, that's the spirit of the story, trying to get voiced. And I guess that's my whole point today, is within me right now and within you is already the spirit of perfect being, completely pure, completely the beauty that God created as each of us. And that is how we are one. And yet, that term oneness is so hard to get a handle on. Because don't we spend most of our lives building this identity around this body, my personal story, my wins, my losses, what I like, what I don't like, what I've achieved, who the heck I am, different from you. And that experience we spend so many times so many years building is really driven by fear because deep within us somewhere we think we have separated from God, from our source, who we really are. And that's very suppressed. And so we make a home somewhere else. We make it in these bodies and in our relationships so it's pretty hard in our walking around the earth in bodies to identify as a perfect being of God, to identify one with God and one with each of you. We kind of have to come at it obliquely through symbols and I'm using that symbol of the circle today. It jumps out at me because the bulk of my lesson is going to be told through a story today because I think stories can speak a lot more eloquently and get through our barriers <laughs> much more authentically than any words I can say right now. But so we use symbols and the author who wrote the story that I'm going to share today, Richard Kennedy, said he was inspired to write the story by the song, May the Circle Be Unbroken. But I'm just going to say right up front, I'm using the circle for the circle of oneness that we're part of. And that circle cannot be broken because it is of God. It's not of us. It is infinite and eternal. It's truth with a capital P. <laughs> How I respond to each of you as a person is a choice I make here in form. But my relationship with each of you is eternal. That's not up to me. That is infinite. And what we spend our time doing here is learning. Oh my gosh. 
I don't live in this one little room house. There's rooms above me, below me, beside me, around me. The kingdom of heaven is immense, but we're so aware of just this little bit that we let ourselves be aware of. So I guess what I'm saying is if we want to grow into that perfect, it's not grow into it, it's become aware of that perfect being within us. We have to first be willing. We use things like symbols and words and stories and song and experiences in nature and the surprises that come every day when our eyes are open to get little glimpses into that immense beauty. And the most powerful way we can find that in ourselves is through each other. Taking the risk of seeing beyond our room, seeing beyond our barriers, and seeing that perfect being beyond us, within us. <laughs> so I'm not even going by my notes here, as you can tell. <laughs> So, but, um, so, little aha moments come to us when we don't expect it. Uh, many years ago, Dick and I were at Chautauqua Institution, and um, we happened to be there on the last day of a visit by an Eastern Orthodox bishop, and he had been giving lessons each day on the way the parables of Jesus are interpreted in the East. So this last day, when we happened to show up, he was talking about the parable of the lost sheep. Well, you know that story. What man with a flock of a hundred sheep and finds that one is missing doesn't leave the flock, go into the wilderness, search, find the lamb, put him over his shoulders, bring him home, and share this wonderful news with all his neighbors and friends rejoicing in the lamb that had been lost is now found. And we here in the West interpret this as rightly this great love that the shepherd that God has for every single one. No one is lost to God. The bishop explained that in the East, the whole flock is not well, while one is not well. We're all lost if one of us is lost. To quote what we said in COVID all the time, we're in this together. Whether we recognize it, whether we're aware of it or not. What I think of you, I'm really thinking of me. I bless you, I bless me. I attack you, I attack myself. And it's not that that perfect being in you or in me can really be attacked. It's our awareness of it. That's our choice every single day, every single moment, what am I willing to risk to know you, to know myself? With these physical senses, I can't see that inner vision. I can't see that perfect self, but with an inner vision, and we do have spiritual vision when we open the door, we can see what these eyes can never see or these hands can never touch. So, okay, I think I'm done talking. <laughs> 
So now I'm going to tell this story. And honestly, I have to tuck my box here into my, practically into my, never mind. Too. <laughs> and now it's slipping all the way down, so I didn't get far enough. So just hold on here. <laughs> why I decided to wear a skirt today, I'll never know. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> there's always room for comic relief, right? <laughs> okay, so, uh, this story was written in 1977 by Richard Kennedy. As I said, it was inspired by the song, May the Circle Be Unbroken. And um, I found it in a book of stories written by Richard Kennedy, but it was originally published singly in 1985, I think, or something like that. So uh, the name of the story is Oliver Hyde's Dishcloth Concert. <sighs> Once there was a man who lived on a scrubby little farm just outside of town and the kind of strange thing, in fact, many people thought it was spooky, was nobody had seen his face for years. Whenever he was outside, he wore his hat down low and he pulled his collar up high. And if somebody came up the hill towards him, he ran up the rest of the way, locked himself in the house and pulled the window shades down. If he needed anything from town, he he put a note on his front door, and a brave errand boy would come up and read the note, go to town, get his supplies, and drop them off. And folks would ask that boy, what do you hear up in that spooky house? Well, darkness, quietness. I heard darkness and quietness. Aren't you scared? Well, a fellow's got to make a living. You know, sometimes children would run up close to that house and they'd sing a little song. Beautiful bride of Oliver Hyde fell down dead on the mountainside. It was true. The man was full of grief and bitterness. He was Oliver Hyde, and his young bride's wagon had been washed down the canyon in a mudslide, and she was killed, horse and all. Sometimes the children would even sing more. Oliver hides a strange old man, sticks in his head in a coffee can, hides his face when folks are about. He's outside in and he's inside out, and then scattle, they'd be off. <sighs> well, really, it was too bad. Oliver used to have many, many friends, and he played the fastest, sweetest fiddle in the county. In fact, for the few short weeks after he was married, he played sweeter than ever. But on the day they buried his wife, he busted that fiddle over the porch rail. And now he just sat up in that house, cold, dark, silent. Oh, folks tried to visit him for a while. They got a little too weird. Well, one day in this story, there was a man walking up the hill toward Oliver's house, and he was carrying a fiddle case. And every once in a while, he'd stop and gather himself and, and continue. He walked right up to the steps of the house. He could see the shades were pulled down. The door was shut tight. He walked up the steps and knocked on the door. Quiet, and then he heard the sound like a chair being scooched across the floor. And a voice said, Come in. 
So the man opened the door a crack. Oliver, it's me, Jim. No answer. He opened the door a little further and put one step in. It was dark and stale. And then over in the corner, just where the light from the door wouldn't quite hit, he saw a figure sitting with its hands on its knees, perfectly still and upright. The head was completely draped with a dishcloth. Not a sound, movement, couldn't even see a breath. Jim opened the door the rest of the way and stepped in. Haven't seen you around for a while, Oliver. No answer. This is why folks stopped coming. It was too strange. But Jim only wanted one word. Oliver had been his best friend, and he had a favor to ask. Oliver, you remember my little girl, Sue? She's getting married. She's all grown up now, Oliver, and, and she's mighty pretty, too. He might as well have been talking to the stove. Well, the thing is, Oliver, I can't imagine marrying my Sue off without you there to play the fiddle. All I need is a yes or a no. Now, behind the dishcloth, Oliver wasn't dead yet. He still had feelings. And Jim had been his best friend. Why, they had played and fought and hunted and fished and grown up together. And he hated to just say no. So he said, no fiddle. But Jim was prepared for that, remember? Doesn't matter, Oliver. Porky Fellow was happy to lend his. He put the fiddle case on the floor and opened it up. Now Oliver felt trapped. It was quiet a long time. And then Oliver said, I can't play the fiddle with the dishcloth on my head. <laughs> but if everybody else will wear one, I'll come and play for you. Well, now Jim was quiet for a long time. <laughs> Finally, he said, all right, Oliver, I'll ask them. And if they won't do it, I'll, I'll come and pick up the fiddle by noon. But if they will, you've got to come now, Oliver. I got your word. It's tomorrow night in Edward's barn. Underneath the dishcloth, Oliver actually smiled to himself. They'd be fools. He'd never be touching that fiddle. Well, so long, said Jim. He went out the door and back into town. Oliver took the dishcloth off his head and looked at that fiddle, and he knew that fiddle, and it was a good one. He wondered if it was in tune. His toes started tapping, and he slapped it. Them cluckheads, what do they know? Can't have fun. He stepped right over that fiddle and went about the rest of his dreary business, but every so often, when he walked through that room and saw the light hitting the horse hair on that bow, he thought it might be new. But no, he knew he'd never be touching that fiddle. He stepped right over it, eventually went to bed. Well, all the next morning, Oliver watched out the window for Jim to come and pick up the fiddle. Noon came, 
saw her had a can of beans. Afternoon wore on and no Jim. Oliver began to get mad. He was ever mad. He was mad he'd ever made that promise. Them donkeys. They tricked me. Finally, it started to get dark. Oliver knew he had to go. A promise is a promise. He pulled his hat down tight, put on his coat, put the collar up. As he started down the hill with the fiddle, he thought, well, I got a trick for them, too. Now, it wasn't a big trick, but it was just a little mean one to make sure that nobody had a good time while Oliver was there. So he walked right in, right to Edward's barn, opened the door and went in. Oh, it was dark, but there were two bare light bulbs, one over the middle and one way down over a little makeshift stage. And as Oliver walked towards that stage, just through the corners of his eyes, under the hat, he could see all the people sitting around the outside with a dishcloth over their face. I guess they know this is just how I like it. Now he got up on the stage, didn't take his hat or his coat off because he knew he'd be leaving soon. And he tuned that fiddle down to a lonesome, fretful sound. He knew they were looking for happy dancing music. And the first tune he played was about a man walking down a long road with no end. And it was gray all about. And he almost wished he were dead because it might be more cheerful. Well, as you can imagine, nobody got up and danced. They just sat there quietly. Now, if sorry I come. And the next tune he played, this one was about a man who thought his heart was a pin cushion. And it seemed like everybody was sticking needles in it. You know that feeling? It almost hurt to listen to that song. And once again, nobody even got up to get punched to lift their spirits. Yeah. Oliver noticed four folks sitting down just beside the stage. He figured those were the other musicians. At first he thought, might be nice to have a little mouth organ or a slide guitar. Nah, I'll play one more song and they'll ask me to leave. Now this one was about a man whose wife had recently died and gone to heaven and wild roses grew all over her tombstone. And Oliver was about halfway through that tune when he remembered that he had told played this song at his own wedding, and that brought him up just a little. But he played the tune out, and as he did so, a tear rolled down his cheek. Good thing nobody could see his face. After that quiet song, he looked again from the corners of his eyes, waiting for someone to tell him to leave, and he saw one white shape amongst the dark ones. That would be the bride. And that made him think of his own bride. And how happy, how pretty she'd been that day. He started to feel a little mean. So he said the first words that had been spoken since he walked into the barn well, I reckon you're all ready for me to leave, and I will. But first, I'll play one happy tune for the bride. And you can all dance, and, and then I'll go home. So he did. He tuned up that fiddle, and he played a fat song. He played a happy song, carried on with that fiddle lively enough to scramble eggs. Once again, nobody clapped. Nobody moved. 
Oh, I forgot about those dishcloths. You can't dance with those dishcloths on your head. Go ahead, take them off. And this time, he went into a song as sweet and lively as anybody ever could. Why, it was enough to get a rock up and dancing. And nobody did. And Oliver began to get mad. Now, come on now. It's time to get a little life. You other musicians, you get up here and help me out now. Folks, get some punch. Take those claws off and let's dance. He stomped his foot three times and he threw into a song that could churn butter. And yet, those musicians did not get up. And when the tune ended, Oliver was left under that bare light bulb all by himself in the silence. And he stood there with his head hanging down, understanding things, how it felt to be on the other side of the silence. When all you really wanted was a sign of life to help you out. So he leaned over and he put the fiddle in the case and closed it up and stepped off the stage and as he walked towards the door, he said, that was a hard lesson, but I got it. When Oliver got to the door, he was just turning the knob when he banged into the guy sitting right next to the door and knocked him off his seat. And Oliver reached down, what? He pushed his hat up. That fella, that was a sack of grain. And the guy next to him, that was a bale of hay. And all around, the whole walls of the barn were sacks of grain and bales of hay. And that white bride, that was a sack of flour. And those four musicians, they were four old saddles sitting on a rail. And when Oliver got back to the door, he could hear music coming from down the street. And he stuck his head out, and there was a door opening with people wandering around in it. And you know what Oliver did? He went and picked up the fiddle back at that stage, and he went down the road. And there was Jim standing right by the open door. Oliver, we've been waiting for you. We're just getting started. Now when Oliver and Jim walked into that barn, it got quiet. First one little group, and then another. And they all turned to look at Jim and Oliver. And Jim made a motion with his hands, and everyone went to sit on chairs along the outside of the barn, and they put dishcloths over their faces. Oliver turned to Jim. Edward's got a new barn, huh? Oh, yeah, I forgot to tell you that. I didn't think about it. He uses that old one to store things. Doesn't matter. Oliver could see the four musicians up front with dishcloths on their faces, and Jim reached in his pocket to pull out a dishcloth, and Oliver said, never mind that, Jim. Just be regular. Everybody else, too. Take those dishcloths off, and let's have us a party. And Oliver walked right up to that stage. He threw his hat on the floor. He put his coat on the chair. Someone brought him a cup of punch. And those musicians and Oliver went into a song that got everybody up on their feet. And they danced, and they played, and they sang all night long. And they all had a wonderful time, even Oliver.
just um, relax as we prepare for meditation. Just enjoy. Thank you, Ayesha and Kathy. So I'm using this song to help us get into that holy place. So our meditation is a good time to do that. So let's now just take the time to go within. It helps to be in a comfortable position, relaxing each part of your body. Sometimes it helps to shrug your shoulders, let them go, tighten your hands, let them go. Tighten your belly, let it go, tighten your legs, let them go. Become aware of your breathing as it slows down. As we rest, within this holy, spacious self. Where it's much easier to just drop the body and become aware of what's here. Picture a large circle of people holding hands holding you. Now see the golden light of God's presence shining through, around, 
within each person, through each person, filling in that circle and just expanding it. Creation goes on and on and on because that's what creating love does. Surely, the presence of God is in this space. Rest in the hush of what can never be broken. We rest in the peace and completeness that is of God and actually of ourselves. Now find one face in the circle of someone who is dear to you. In your mind, look closely at this dear face. The perfect being within that face has made itself known to you in some way through this world. Now say thank you. Thank you. deep inside each of you. The one knows the other in a whole perfect communion. Thank you. And now let's take a risk. It doesn't matter which side of the dishcloth you're on, whether you're willing to put it on or whether you're willing to take it off. Let's find a person in the circle who is a pain in the butt to you. Might be someone who irritates you. Might be someone you see on TV. It might be someone that makes you anxious or afraid. However we respond to that person, we're either opening our awareness of ourselves and them, or we're keeping that door locked. That person is our opportunity. Let's go there and take a minute and make a choice. In my earthly form and body, and likes and dislikes, I don't have to like this person. But if I never get past that, I'll never know anything else. I 
one would really like the peace of God to rest in. If you choose, tell this person thank you for giving me a choice. If you want to, ask to see the perfect being within that's hidden by fear, the same fears we hold, the same confusion, and yet, surely, the presence of God is here. Thank you for being the presence of the Lord in my life right now. And as we look around the circle, more and more aware of all that is blooming and the great beauty, the great glory in each face, the glimpses of something so dear to us and somehow very familiar, and we're reminded of the kingdom of heaven that we're told is within us. Hmm. Little by little, as we come back to our bodies and our seats, Just keep saying thank you to the people around us, to the people in our lives, the people who came before us, the people who will come after us on this earthly experience, and mostly to that pure being within us that keeps moving us ever, ever more awake, aware. Thank you.
Thank you, Mary Jo, for a beautiful lesson and a very soothing and insightful meditation. May we offer. I love story. I love storytelling and story. So storytellers, thank you. You do it so well. At this time, as you recognize your abundance, all that you have been gifted by our Holy Creator from source, will you address your willingness to share that abundance with this ministry so that we may continue to grow and offer this love and serenity to all who enter this holy space at this time? So feel free to join in. <laughs> this is group participation. Are you welcome to stand if you like? Yeah, you can stand if you like. One love, one heart. Let's get together and feel all right. Hear the children crying, one love. Hear the children crying, ah. Oh, give thanks and praise to the Lord, and I will feel all right. Let's get together and feel all right. Whoa, 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 whoa. Let them all pass there. Dirty remarks, one love. There is a question I'd really love to ask. One heart, is there a place for the hopeless spinner who has hurt all mankind just to save his own beliefs? One love, what about the one heart? One heart, what about it? Let's get together and as it was in the beginning, one love, so shall it be in the end. One ah, oh, give thanks and praise to the Lord, and I will feel all right. Oh, let's get together and feel all right. One more thing, let's get together and fight this holy Armageddon. One love. <laughs> No, no, two. One song. Have pity on those whose chances grow thinner. There ain't no hiding place for the Father of creation. Singing one love. What about the one heart? One heart. Let's get together and feel all right. I'm pleading to mankind. One love. Oh, Lord. One heart, give thanks and praise to the Lord, and I will feel all right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> feel all right as it was in the beginning. Oh, so shall it be in the end. Oh, give thanks and praise to the Lord, and I will feel all right. Oh, let's get together and all right, give thanks and praise to the Lord, and I will feel all right. Let's get together and feel all right. <laughs> From the movie Annie, right? Oh my gosh! I don't know why. Where did that come from? I don't know. But we thank each one of you for this glorious 
abundance that you have shared with us so that we may continue to grow and offer the ministries that fill your heart in all gratitude. Thank you and blessings. If you are not receiving the newsletter, please sign up at unityrochester.org. Barbara Boyce puts out a fabulous newsletter, contributions by our speakers, by board members, so please make yourself uh, available to that. Reiki, the next time, April 21st, before service in the Sunday school room. Seems like there was something else I was going to tell you. Sorry? Daryl's class, um, jo Dr. Joe Despenda's pro progressive course on meditation facilitated by Daryl every Tuesday here in the sanctuary. Daryl, hey. Daryl told me before service that I'm supposed to point this back there. Because <laughs> I'm up here going, come on, come on, come on, come on. So if it looks like this is what I'm doing. Prayer chaplains are available for personal prayer support before and after every service. Before service, out in the lobby near the seating area, on the coffee table, and after service. What we'll do after the service is clear out the sanctuary so it can be nice and quiet in here for folks who would like to pray. And we will sing the prayer for protection together. Kathy, thank you. Aisha, thank you. Beautiful. Whenever you're ready, Kathy. The light of God surrounds us. The love of God enfolds us. The power of God protects us. The presence of God watches over us. Wherever we are, God is and all is well. The light of God surrounds us. The love of God. is over us wherever we Let's gather around the outside of the sanctuary and if you're comfortable holding hands and singing, let there be peace on earth and then we'll go out and have some goodies. <laughs> <laughs> 